Thank you very much for being with us. Please tell me your name and your affiliation. I'm Simon Hooper. I'm the co-founder of Remy Life, and uh, this is the company in the healthcare sector that is doing something pretty new at the moment. Okay, so what is it? What does Remy Life do? We have spent the last three years building an app that supports the elderly and those with dementia from diagnosis to end of life, and we've been in the formal care sector. So our, our app is being used in care homes, daycare centers, memory centers, centers and clinics. But now we're launching into the consumer space with the Remy Life brand. So it's a membership proposition, a membership platform for those that have care needs in their life to be part of. Well, we will certainly get old. It is much better than the alternative, but uh, to have a person with those specific needs in uh, your, your family uh, puts a special burden on everybody, especially because we are not specialists. We don't know often what needs to be done. How does your approach solve or, or attempts to solve that issue? I think solve is probably too strong a word, but it addresses specific needs. And um, one of the big issues is that we all take a journey. We all take a journey from diagnosis to end of life. And your needs vary as you make that journey from cognitive capacity at the moment of diagnosis through to end of life. And all that knowledge that is built up about yourself just doesn't go with you. So those carers you encounter, those care organisations you engage, they don't know you and they should. So we've found over the last few years that person-centred care, which is a theory you hear propounded, it's, it's policy, it's, it's healthcare policy. Person-centred care doesn't really happen because the carer doesn't know you. If you provide a means for the carer to know you, it has a remarkable impact on well-being, family well-being, quality of care, and surprisingly, on the bottom line of the business. So what we've built is a mechanism that captures knowledge of the person through digital activities, which we all indulge in every day, and that data set is used to enhance care along the journey. Um, for those of the viewers who don't know uh, the difference, is your um, approach specific for uh, dementia alone or there are other conditions like Alzheimer's uh, that are sufficiently similar uh, in their outcomes that uh, they can also be uh, um, treated or uh, uh, handled through uh, Remolife's uh, solutions? Yeah, we started with dementia through personal experience. I mean, this is a, a personal mission uh, for both for myself and my co-founder Etienne. But um, we found that those in the early stages of dementia are quite naturally in denial and elderly care is often no different. So elderly care is really our principal focus now. But what we do is put the person at the center of their care and enable them to control their engagement with consumers. And of course that works for many different worlds. So we've done work with learning disabilities, even foster care it works for. But we've got to, we've got to walk before we run. We've got a long way to go before we can really focus on their fields. We, we know our way around dementia and elderly care. And we've, we've gained you know, regulatory approval. We have NHS approval, numerous approvals, GP prescribability on the way. So that's our principal sector, elderly care and dementia. Give me an example or two of how concretely the app uh, is used uh, by the, the, the person directly affected or uh, by the, the, the family or the carers. I'll give you a quick use, well, I wouldn't say quick, but I'll give you a use case, an actual example. Um, again, a gentleman called David in a care home, um, mid-stage dementia, agitated, bangs his head against the wall, ex-plumber. So they used our system to build knowledge of that person in the system. They created a reminiscence session around plumbing. He was a plumber. He says the word tank a lot. So they put lots of pictures of water tanks in there, hoping he would engage, because it's all about engagement at any stage of elderly care and dementia. But the system is an algorithm, so whilst they were showing him this reminiscence session, the system said, well, he was around during the war, and tank means other things. So it brought up a picture of a tank to see what would happen. And David went, MK6 stroke 92B7, he quoted a serial number. So they realised he was interested in military tanks, not water tanks. The system automatically sent a notification to his family care circle. His brother in Auckland, who he hadn't seen for 20 years, received this automatic email that said, David has just shown interest in military tanks, can you help with this new knowledge? He had a picture of David sitting on a gun barrel of a tank eating an ice cream with his shirt off, 1947. He put it into the system. A week later, the carer in the daycare centre ran the reminiscence session. There was the content. Now they have a way to calm David whenever he becomes agitated. David, I understand you're in the tanks. I've done it myself. He calms immediately. Now that sounds lightweight, but when he goes to Kingston Hospital, 
a dementia ward and he's agitated, any hospital, traditionally they'd medicate him. And he would probably have a well-being decline take place because of the medication. Now when he's agitated, they can press a button and say, David, you're in the tanks. And get him through into the ward, reduce well-being decline, earlier death discharge, less bed blocking, which is a big issue in many hospitals, and of course a return to his original point of care, which could be for the family, the home where they want him to stay, or wherever he, wherever he happens to be. It's a win, 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 win for many different people, all and many different organisations, just from one little bit of knowledge. It's a remarkable thing. So uh, you said that uh, the uh, system is a um, subscription service. Uh, if I have a large extended family with members in Australia, will that uh, free cost the, a lot? Uh, it's free for the family, completely okay. free for the family, unless they want to deploy our Alexa services, which will be launched um, in a more um, substantial manner around December, God willing, code is depending, at around 299 So it's cheap. The, the money we generate is from scale, so having, uh, as you say, many family members deploying Alexa, um, but of course the care facilities pay a subscription because not only does the system provide the care engagement that I've just described, improving person-centered care, but when the person or the family encounter a care facility, we provide a suite of tools that are business tools that support that care facility. So client nurturing, staff training, regulatory reporting. There's a whole range of business services that the data set that we collect, which we call electronic life records, not EMR medication, not EPR, not EMR, but a brand new data set, which we call electronic life records, ELR, that data set supports a lot of business needs. No one's ever done it before. It's incredible for me to think that Facebook captured this data set, of course, and they use it and do very nicely by it, but no one's ever deployed it in the medical world. So that's what we're doing. So, so you are planning to retrace the same mistakes that Facebook already did twice over? Well, no, this is what we're launching. We are launching a proposition whereby the consumer has control of their data. They decide who uses that data, who has access to, to it. And of course, if they decide to have it deployed, whether it's for research or even for um, services provisioned through the Remy Life platform, they get rewarded for it. So we're monet they are monetizing their data. Of course, we gain some revenue from it, but they control their data. Hence the deployment of blockchain in terms of you know, validation and, and, and security of the data. But also we are soon to launch a what we, we consider to be an incentivization mechanism, a means to incentivize improved care. So I used to reward my mother's carers by sending them bottles of wine, which you know, perhaps not the right thing to do, they were very happy with it, but now you'll be able to tokenize that relationship, reward with tokens. So we'll be deploying tokens along that care journey from diagnosis to end of life. So you can reward carers in a care home. There's a multiplicity of situations along that care journey where if you have a loyal membership, they can use tokens to improve and enhance care and, um, and care engagement. Um, how is uh, the National Health Service uh, perceiving uh, the power and, and the revolutionary uh, implication of an approach like this that uh, um, overcomes uh, maybe the more sedate uh, uh, use of technology that they are accustomed to and uh, uh, embraces a more stakeholder mm. uh, driven and, and, and broader mm. and deeper set of relationships. That's Have you been able to engage them at all? God, that's a hell of a question. Um, we've been around long enough to have watched the transition in the, uh, the mood of the NHS towards adopting technology. Um, three years ago, technology, I mean, of course they're using technology for numerous uh, medical practices, but technology for person-centered care wasn't considered to be practical either in, ter in terms of time uh, or adoption. But it all boils down to money. If you can show that there's going to be a time saving, staff saving, or any sort of monetary saving, then adoption will begin to take place. But legacy is also a big issue. I mean, the average hospital has 400 apps running at any one time. So there's, there's a myriad of issues, especially with um, the NHS, which you'd think of as one homogenous entity. If it succeeds here, you can roll it out across the whole lot, but they're, they're individual businesses. So it's very hard. So for us, the NHS is about it being a validator of what we're doing, an evidence-based gathering exercise, which we've done, and we've done that for each care sector. So we've validated ourselves in care homes, hospitals, daycare centers, memory clinics. But now we're finding the next step for us is, is private medicine. So we're about to start working with a major hospital chain, who I can't say who they are, but they have two million patients at any one time, and they are looking to provide 
post-surgery support. And that's, of course, what we offer. We offer them a means to have knowledge of the person post that surgery. So we're seeing a change in the world right now. We're seeing a response to the fact, shall we say, that in the US, 18% of, of GDP is spent on healthcare. There's, we're seeing the world looking to tech to find solutions. And, and we're definitely part of that. Uh, what are your international or global expansion plans? Of course, uh, the <laughs> situations that you are addressing are universal. Yeah. Well, the UK has been our test bed, obviously, but uh, we are in, in Delhi, Australia, Hong Kong. We have a Chinese partner. Uh, we, talk, we have someone in Ireland. Uh, we get calls from everywhere all the time. Our need now is to raise funds at scale to be able to scale, to capture the opportunity that we've got. Because no one's doing what we're doing at the moment. I'm, I'm sure others will come along, but at the moment we do have a, a unique window of opportunity to deploy at scale. So, so how are you uh, going about uh, raising your funds? To date, when we first started, of course, people laughed at the proposition of person-centred care having any real financial potential to it. So we raised our money from crowdfunding. We have the support of some well-known people. One of our early investors was Sir Vince Cable, who's the leader or ex-leader of the Liberal Democratic Party. We have healthcare leaders. We have the leaders of care. We raised our money from two categories, those in the care industry who understood what we were doing, which of course is easy to understand if you're in the sector, and from those who have elderly care or dementia in their lives. So that's where we raised our money. We have, we raised, we have 121 investors, we raised half a million, and we built the system. But now to go to scale, we have to either look to traditional methods, such as VC funding, or continue with crowdfunding, uh, or look to some more original strategies. And there's some interesting worlds that are attached to the world of blockchain, because of course blockchain will be the mainstay for the tokenization process, for the ability to lock up uh, the transactional trail of data, and so forth. So we're looking to see what there is available in the world of blockchain that is regulatory appropriate, and which can make it possible to, to democratize that data. We want our members to benefit from the growth of our company. We want them to participate and profit share in the growth of our company. It's their data, it's their health, they should benefit. So we're looking to some creative um, solutions at the moment, um, such as the Decentralized Autonomous Trust presents, for example. Uh, how does uh, the DAT work? Uh, the DAT works on the basis of being a standard investment instrument one that is uh, perhaps less regulatory, regulatory contentious than an ICO the, um, or, or, or an IEO. And it takes the proposition that a, um, a standard financial instrument can be fractionalized and investors can buy a component part of that. And part of the investment goes into a reserve fund which provides security. So the bottom line to that is that it addresses those failings, if you like, of other former blockchain financing methods mm -hmm. provide security, liquidity, and regulatory compliance. It's a complex proposition. I suggest you go online and have a look at it. Um, recently, Forbes wrote an article on it because it's definitely generating interest. So this is what we're looking at doing because it gives a means for our members to participate in the company. Uh, being able to align the interests of various stakeholder groups is kind of the holy grail yes. of uh, entrepreneurs who want to build uh, uh, applications and platforms that have a legacy and positive impact in society. It looks like your project uh, really is uh, one of those that uh, deserve to succeed because it is addressing a huge problem with uh, innovation but also with a very humane and human attitude. Thank you very much for being uh, here with us. Congratulations for all your progress uh, uh, until now and good luck with uh, the next steps for Rama Life. Thank you, David.